All right, everybody. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Father, as we come into this room today, Father, as we worship the Lord already, Father, let that spirit not, not stop now. Let it continue, Father, in the Word. Lord, we thank you that Jesus is the Word and that we, the Word. we celebrate, Father, the life of Jesus Christ this morning. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that, Father, that you would come speak through the Word. That, Lord, that there are people in the sanctuary today that, Father, may be dealing with uh, issues and problems. Lord, we thank you that, Lord, addictions and all the pains and ills of the world have to flee before the name of Jesus. So, Lord, I ask that today would be a day of freedom. Father, today would be a day where chains got broken and, Father, oppressions got released. So, Lord, we ask that today that, Father, we just see you in your full light and your full glory. In Jesus' mighty name. And God's people said. <clears throat> so, guys, today... If you are one of those people that need to have a name for the message, um, I'm going to be preaching about something today, and I hope that you catch this, because the, the name of the message today is Receiving God's Grace in Vain. We need to be very careful that we do not receive the grace of God in vain. Now, as we start looking at this over this morning, you're probably wondering, what has that got to do with Christmas? Well, it's got everything to do with Christmas. When we come into the house of God, we need to understand that we are there to celebrate not just on Christmas Day, but every day, the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? You see, Christmas itself is a wonderful day. But without Resurrection Sunday, then it's meaningless. Amen? It's a key. It's a part of the story of God uh, bringing restoration of, of man back to God. But it's just a part. And so when we start looking, <laughs> I almost kicked the plan into the front row. <clears throat> I teach it to be in my way. I'll be dang. So the one thing that I'm going to share with you this morning is I want to speak to you about a few things. And I want you to ask yourself some questions as we're going along does this apply to you? Because when we celebrate the, the birth of Christ, we celebrate the return of the Word back to the world. At the end of the Old Testament, but before we start going into the New Testament time frame, there was 400 years that the Word of God was not on this earth. It was not here. No prophets were being spoken to. Nothing was being shared with the people and they were left all of their own except for the writings of the prophets of old. Now granted they may have been the prophets of bold but yet we need a fresh new word every day in our lives. Amen. You cannot live on yesterday's encouragement because yesterday's encouragement loses its potency somewhere along the way. We have got to realize that Every day we need a new word. So that's why it's so important to get up every day and get into your Bible, to read the word, to see what it says for you today, and see what it says, because I promise you, you can take a scripture today and read it, and then you can read it tomorrow and it'll say something completely different to you. And so you need a fresh new word. So when we see that that 400 years disappeared at the delivery of Jesus into this world, we find out one thing, without the world or without the word, we're lost, amen? How many of you have ever tried to walk through a dark room and you couldn't see anything in there before? You didn't know what was there and you stumble and trip over something, you fall and you, you hit your head and you fall down and say, man, that's stupid, and you jump back up wondering, did anybody see me do that? Anybody ever do that? Or is that just me? When you go into a dark room, there is nothing that feels more powerless than that right there. Because we're so dependent upon our eyesight. We're so dependent on being able to see something. Could you imagine when we go up in town and you go through the intersections and you see all those college students out there with the canes and they're learning what it's like to walk uh, blind and they have to go through the intersections to be able to listen, to be able to experience, to be able to feel. You know, we have gotten so reliant upon our eyesight for everything that we have almost an impossible idea of what it would like to be blind. But do you know, unfortunately, people do adjust and adapt to being blind. Matter of fact, if you don't see something, you have to adjust, and that's where the world was at that point in time. But how much easier is it when we have the light where we can see where we're going? Psalms 119, verses 105. Now, Psalms 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. It is exactly almost halfway through uh, the Bible. And it says in Psalms 105, verses 105, uh, 
Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Guys, I think one of the greatest uh, things that has ever been made is those little flashlights that you put on your keychains. How many of you have been over at Tractor Supply and you always see a little box of them right there by the cash register? It's an impulse buy. You think, oh, I need one of those. Because how many of you ever been trying to fumble over trying to put a key in a car or in your front door without a light on? And a little light like that can make all the difference in the world of being able to see where do I stick this key? Instead of scratching your paint up on your car. Amen? How many of you ever seen a car where it's got scratches all around the door lock? I've had a truck like that before. Why? Because I was, unfortunately, back in the time, I was a sinner. I was going to bars and leaving bars and trying to get into a vehicle. I do not recommend that lifestyle to anybody anymore. What I've seen now is I've seen a change in life. How many of you have noticed a change in life since you came to Christ? And it changed you from inner to outer. I want to talk about that light today. Because when Jesus came to the earth, he referred to himself as the light of the world. How many of you know when somebody stands up and says, hey, I'm the light of the world, you probably think you're pretty full of it. Amen? I'm pretty sure that when Jesus was speaking about that back in the day, people were probably thinking, man, you have flipped your lid. If you would, please open up your Bibles to John chapter 1, please. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, we're going to be going from verses 1 through 18. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that had been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into this world. He was in the world, and though though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning Him, and he cries out, saying, This was He whom I said, He was who comes after me, has surpassed me, because He was before me. From the fullness of His grace we have received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God the one and the only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. See guys, Jesus is the Word, he was also the light of all men. I got really confused there for a while. For a couple of years, I kept reading over the Scripture, and I had a hard time making understanding. But in verses 16, it says, From the fullness of grace we have received blessing uh, after another. How many of you have been blessed through your relationship with Jesus Christ? How many have been set free, and you've had things that drop off of you? Your life has changed. Now, let's look in verse 17. It says, For the law was given through Moses. How many of you know the law is good? And it helps you, amen, especially if you don't break the law. But how many of you have been lawbreakers? How many of you have been outlaws? So guess what? Because you were an outlaw, now you need grace. And you need peace. And it says, for grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And then verse 18, I want you to ponder on this one for a little bit. It says, no one has ever seen God. How many of y'all in this room can ever say that you ever saw God face to face? Please raise your hand, because I want to know what he looks like. Mark Green has already told us that the Holy Spirit sounds like Mark Green. I can appreciate that, 
But I want to know what does the face of God look like? I want to know. How do we know about the face of God? How do we know what he, who he is? How do we know about all these things? It says, but no one has ever seen God, but, how many of you know, but God. This is where we get this, but God. The one and the only who is at the Father's side. Who is at the Father's side? Jesus Christ. It is saying right there that Jesus Christ is of the Godhead. He is right there, but God, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. The whole purpose for Jesus Christ to come to this earth was to make God known, to bring the word back to the world so that people could be able to hear the word and have the word. How many of you know it's not just enough to hear it, but you got to have it? Amen? How many of you have ever been to somebody's dinner table or gone to a restaurant with a friend? And you came in and you sat down and they're eating and you're just sitting there and you look over and you see a French fry on their plate and that temptation is to reach over and just grab that French fry. You just want it so bad. We have this little contest in our family. Whenever we go someplace with Jonathan, I've always got to steal at least one French fry off of his plate. Why? Because I want something. I want to keep him on guard. I want him watching. I want him to be aware of what's going on around. Let me tell you something. If you are aware that there is a thief that is trying to steal, kill, and destroy, you will stand on guard. And without the word, you will not know what the enemy is about doing. Guys, do you understand that the enemy wants to knock you down off your peg? And let me tell you something. Christmas is one of the greatest times to do that. Why? Because we're distracted. You see, I want you to understand that today, only in Jesus will you ever find life. Guys, I've lived, you've lived, we've all lived without Christ. But how many of you know that's not really living? Guys, what is living? What is it about? It's about being with friends. It's about being with people who believe in you. It's about being with you and living life. Let me tell you something. Blood is good, but let me tell you something. Bond is so much better. You see, because when you got people that love you and are willing to sacrifice with you, they will be with you through thick and thin. The Bible says that there is a brother that is born from adversity. How many of you have been through some adversity in your life? Oh, come on, are you with me this morning? How many of you have been walking through something bad and you need a friend? Let me tell you something, when you walk through something, that's when you start feeling alone. That's when you start thinking, man, I sure wished I had somebody. But let me tell you something, when you're in the body of Christ, you're never alone. When you're in the body of Christ, you've always got somebody there with you. Guys, I want to encourage you, if you feel like you are alone in today's world, open yourself up. Open yourself up to other people and allow the light of Christ to shine from those people on those areas where you may need light. The light is stronger than darkness. How many of you ever been in a power shortage or power outage at your house? What's the first thing that you do is you run and go find candles or lanterns or anything else that you have, any kind of a source of light. Why? Because you want the light. You want to see what's going on. Although there ain't no power, you might as well just shut the light off and go to sleep. Amen? But you see, we want to have security, and light brings us security. As do you understand that the light of Christ will bring you the security that you need? When you need security, you need to have light. And I want you to understand darkness has no power. Do you understand that? Darkness does not have any power or any strength. What is darkness? It's just the complete absence of light. When you have light, darkness disappears. It's gone. And you have light. Why? Because light has power. Darkness does not. And some of you say, but pastor, the enemy has been whooping up on me. Well, get to the light. Get to Jesus. Get into the Word of God and start reciting the Word of God over your life and into your problems. And start praying the Word of God. If you'll look in, if you'll turn over to John chapter 8, verses 12. Jesus says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Guys, I I can tell you so many times, I've watched people go through things, and I've seen them just give up. And there are times that you walk through that really are hard to walk through, especially when you need a healing and you haven't gotten it, especially when you need finances and you don't have it. 
especially when you're coming up on a holiday and you're thinking, man, my kids are not going to get all the presents in the world. Let me tell you something, that's okay. Because most of those presents are going to wind up in a trash can somewhere in about six months. But yet what you do for your children in teaching them how to walk in a moral and righteous way will last them the rest of their lifetime. Honoring baby Jesus, honoring that baby that's in the crib. Now guys, I'm looking at this Timber Creek Church up here in town that's got this big manger. How many of y'all been watching that? I'm waiting to see that baby get up in that thing because that's going to be the biggest Jesus I've ever seen. Has anybody put one in there yet? Does anybody know? I've seen all these bales of hay going in there, and I keep thinking, man, I've got to see this baby. What are they going to do, drop it in by a crane? How many of you remember the nativity scene that was up here in, um, in town? There's a little house off of Austin Street right there on the corner of Austin and Regay, I think it is. And there's a house that always had a little manger scene right there. Somebody a few years ago thought that it was cool and stole baby Jesus out of the nativity scene. How many of you know you can try as you will, but you will never steal Jesus from Christmas? Amen? Little baby dolls don't mean anything, and they put out a reward for the return of Jesus. Well, guys, I didn't know he was missing. Amen? Man, I don't know about y'all, but I keep wondering, when do we find Jesus? Is Jesus just a piece of plastic that's in a nativity scene? Is he a sale at Walmart? Is he this thing that's going on in the door busters over at Target at midnight? Guys, let me tell you something. Don't be waiting for the after Christmas sales. Let me tell you something. Get on board with Jesus now before it's too late. Because I'm telling you what, Christmas is a great time of the year. But I'm going to be honest with you. I like Thanksgiving so much better. Why? Because it's about sitting there with your family. Guys, I want to encourage you, don't get caught up in the finances. Don't get caught up in all these things. Enjoy your time with your children. Guys, have you ever known that if you stay in the dark way too long, it changes who you are? Uh, There was a program that I saw on, on TV here a while back on a science channel, and they had this lake that was in this cave underground, and the fish had been living in this cave for so long that they had lost their eyeballs. They didn't have any more eyes. They couldn't see. They didn't need them. They had learned to adapt and live in that darkness, and they did not need eyes. How many of you know that it's a sad thing when you're living in the darkness so long that you lose the ability to be able to see? Guys, the world was like that for that 400 years. We had lost our true eyesight. Jesus came that he would be able to be the light of the world so that those who would be able to see would be able to walk and have life. Guys, I'm going to be honest with you. Life don't begin until you start living for Jesus. When you start living for Jesus, the honky-tonks lose their appeal. How many of you remember Dwight Yoakam back in the day? Guys, I'm telling you what, guitars, Cadillacs, and hillbilly music. I remember the ripped jeans. Guys, those were good times back in the days, wasn't they? How many of you remember, man, you couldn't wait to get out on a Friday night or a Saturday night? But let me tell you something. I have the hardest time waiting for Sunday morning. Why? Because Sunday morning is the day where everybody comes in the church, and it's the day we become a family. And it's the day that we get a chance to see everybody and all the goods and all the bads. And let me tell you something, I would much rather be with church family on Sunday and Wednesdays than I would ever be anywhere else. Why? Because this is where life is at. This is where the Spirit of God is. If you would, turn over to Isaiah chapter 9, please. Guys, y'all ain't going to believe this, but we're probably going to be finished really early this morning. I'm surprised nobody's calling me a liar. Thank you, Bubba. Isaiah chapter 9. Verses 1 through 7. In the book of Isaiah, it tells us about Jesus to come. And the Word of God is exact in everything. When you see where something happened hundreds of years before, and yet it was exact, God is trying to give you hope. In verses 1 in Isaiah chapter 9, it says, Nonetheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. 
In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and in the future he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death, and a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and you increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the days of Midian defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar that has crossed their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. Every warrior's boot used in battle, every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us... A child is born, to us a son is given, and to the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. See, God foretold the coming of Christ so that we would always have hope. How many of you have woke up and realized you didn't have any hope and it just didn't seem like that special of a day that you just didn't want to be there? Let me tell you, God wanted you to have hope. He wanted you to be able to wake up and say, man, there's something good that's going to come out of this day. Even if it's a little bit. How many of you have had a day where you struggled for something good to happen in your day? Just one thing, possibly. That one thing that would make you thankful that you got up out of bed. But you see, God gave you something so much bigger. He gave you the opportunity to walk in peace, to walk in restoration. I don't know about y'all, but I am so ready for the day that my body is restored. How many of you are tired of all the cricks and groans and snaps and pops? I'm tired of my son calling me a cereal box. I'm tired of being called Rice Krispies because I got a snap, crackle, and pop. I'm starting to call him Fruit Loops or Special K. You know, and you sit there and you think, wonder when does this restoration, because when you look in the mirror, how many of you still think that you look like you're 20? You still think you got it until you realize you don't. And usually when you realize you don't, it's way too late. Guys, I want you to understand something today. There is a restoration that has come. And sometimes we wait for the body to be restored. But how about we look to see about the spirit being restored? Our souls being restored. When light appears in your life, it's a salvation moment. Guys, I want you to understand, when you have a salvation moment, your life changes from that moment forward. You can never be the same anymore. You can't go back. Why? Because life loses its meaning. It's like Psalms 23 is a description of life. When you go from being in the dark, all of a sudden you start having green pastures. You have quiet waters. Your soul gets restored. You find the path of righteousness. How many of you want to be living in a situation like that? I am ready to see, as Jesse said earlier, for y'all that like cold weather, uh, welcome to your two months. I ain't going to lie to you. I don't care for these two months. Why? Because my pastures out there, they're like eating up. They're brown. They're gone. And now I'm putting out hay every week, you know, for horses to be able to eat. And every day that I'm having to put hay out, guess what? That's money that's not in my pocket anymore. And all of a sudden, I start seeing during this, two, in this, in this period of time, it's almost depressing. How many of you have ever been going someplace in the middle of winter and everything else is brown? And then you go by this section where somebody has planted some winter rye and everything is green. The sides of the road is green and it just catches you by surprise. And you're like, wow, there's something green. There's something that looks pretty. It looks like it's alive. Do you know that once you've had your moment where you've come to Christ, people see you in that same light? Even in the worst of times, in the coldest of times, they see life coming out of you. Even when it doesn't make sense. Jesus is right there. Let's turn over to the story of the birth of Jesus in Luke chapter 2, please. Luke chapter 2, verses 4 through 7.
Luke chapter 2, starting in verses 4. It says, So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. See, God sent a, his son into the world that did not have room for him in their community. Remember, they had lost the word of God for 400 years, and they did not have the word, and they were not ready for Jesus when they came in. How many of you know what it's like to know about something, but not to know them? You see, the world knew that Jesus, there was going to be a Messiah that was going to come, but they didn't know when, they didn't know where, and they didn't know who. But yet they knew but yet they'd quit looking for it. They quit wondering, is today that day? Guys, I want you to be expecting every day when you get up in life, expect that this is the day that Jesus shows up in his life. Today is the day that the rapture happens. Today is the day that you get to see Jesus face to face. Today is the day that all of a sudden your life changes forevermore. When you have an expectant life, then all of a sudden, then it's easier to start seeing Jesus every day. Let's look at this trip to Bethlehem a little bit. It says he came out of the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea and then to Bethlehem. Guys, I looked up the mileage. Do you know that as the bird flies, it's 70 miles a journey with a pregnant woman on a donkey? How many of you know poor Joseph, by the time he got there, he was probably about ready to lose his mind? How many pregnant women here in their last month of delivery wants to ride a donkey 70 miles? Anybody? Can you imagine what that was like? And then it got to thinking, I bet you she was saddle sore. I bet you she was hurting by the time they got there. How many of you remember what it was like carrying a baby throughout those years? And then all of a sudden, now she's in a town where she's not from. And nobody has room for her. Nobody made room for this Savior. Why? Because they wasn't looking for him. With all the prophecies that was given about what was to come, people had quit looking and living according to the Word of God. Guys, how many times have you ever known what God had said to you, but yet you quit looking for it? And you ignored what God has said. Then you wake up and realize you missed the greatest blessing that you ever could have received. In verses 8 through 20, and it says, And then there were shepherds living in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Please underline that right there. Please underline whom his favor rests. Guys, do you understand that God's favor rests upon you? Do you realize that? God's favor rests upon you. You don't have to struggle and fight through life. Why? Because you have God's favor that rests upon you. In verses 15, it says, When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told to them and about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. See, God's God favor rest upon you, but yet those that are prepared, those that are waiting, why did God show up to the, the shepherds? One, because they were awake. How many of you know you watch the flock at night because that's when the wolves come in? 
Everybody else was at home asleep and comfortable. How many of you got your little favorite throw blanket that you like to curl up with on the couch in front of the fireplace and get comfy, get you a cup of coffee or hot chocolate, and you're just relaxing, right? But you see, God came to those who were actually on alert, that were standing guard and watching. Why? Because they were awake and they were willing. Sometimes we have to be uncomfortable and God will catch us right when we're uncomfortable, right when we're not being pampered at home. And it says they got up and they left and they went and saw this thing. Guys, I don't know about y'all, but I'm going to promise you, if I was God, this is not how I would save the world by sending a baby. That just is such an odd thing because why? I love my child so much that I don't think I could sacrifice my child. How many of you could sacrifice your child? Some of you say, well, it just depends on what day you ask. (laughs) Rayford, did you say which one? (laughs) Be very afraid. But you see, sometimes you kind of get to this point where you wonder. And I want you to understand something. God's favor rests upon you. You're so special that he would give his son that he would sacrifice his only son so that you would have the opportunity to believe, to be able to be receiving, to have that eternal gift. Amen? How many of you are walking through a problem right now and you feel like you're alone? Raise your hands. I want you to know something. You're not alone. If the favor of God rests upon you, what did Jesus say that when he came back, he said, I was sent to declare the year of the Lord's favor. How many of you need, had a bad year in 2020? 2021 was a rough year. Guys, I would love to tell you that next year is going to get better. I would love to tell you that. But I can't. Because I remember going from 2019 and 2020, I'm thinking, woohoo, we're getting out of 2019. It's got to be a better year. And then 2020 showed up, and man, there went everything. And then 2020 ended, and you're thinking, thank goodness, it's only going to get better from here. 2021 ain't been much better. But you see, when you look in your scriptures, you start seeing there's things that are coming in advance and we need to have peace now so that we can walk through those times and know that we're not alone. You see, we're not exempt from hard times. But that's why God gave us Jesus so that we could have peace. When you receive Jesus, you receive the Father. And I don't know about you, remember we asked here earlier about has anybody seen the face of God? I can't wait for the day that we sit around the throne and we cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb of God. And we see the Father on the throne. That would be the greatest gift that you could ever get. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I want you to turn there. This is the one scripture that everything is based on tonight. And I want you to underline this. I want you to mark it because it's a very important scripture. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Second in chapter six, and verses one. It says, "As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For He says, "In the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you now is the time of God's favor, and now is the day of salvation." Guys, I want you to hear me. Don't miss out on the benefits of God's grace through the birth of Christ. See, so many times we know about what's going to happen and we receive that grace, we receive that word, but we receive it in vain because we change it to be something that it's not meant to be. And let me tell you something, the Christmas that we're living now is not the Christmas that it was supposed to be. Last night we were at the house and we were watching The Grinch Stole Christmas. Anybody got one of those traditions? Do you like to watch that? And it was the Jim Carrey, the Jim Carrey version I guess it is. It's not the great version. And it's got this little girl on the front of it, in the front of the show, and she's trying to ask what she wants for Christmas. 
And she didn't even know what to ask for. And she says that, I don't know what to ask for. And she was having this struggle of faith and this struggle of this Christmas season. Guys, how many of you are struggling with faith right now during this time? It's easy to turn around and say you're struggling. Okay? We're all going through some things. But I sat there and I thought, and they were talking about all these gifts, and they were trying to, the mayor was trying to give this girl a car and all these other things. And everybody had made Christmas about material worth and material wealth. And let me tell you something that is not Christmas. That is not what Christmas is about. Christmas is about Jesus Christ coming onto this earth as a child, being born unto a woman, into a virgin conception. How many of you know that's impossible? That is impossible. But yet, it happened. God made the impossible possible. Why? Because if it was of anybody else, if it was of a human desire, then Jesus would not have been born to be able to save us. Amen? How many of you know you needed a, a Savior that had no sin? Why? Because we got plenty of it. We got more than our fair share. When you receive God's grace, you have to get to this point where you know about God's will. And you start realizing what God has for you and stored for you in your life. Some of you are young, and some of you are in young families. Some of you are older. Some of you are in retirement age. And some of you are just waiting for Jesus to come back today. And let me tell you something, depending on what your stage is in your life, God still has a plan for you. Regardless of who you are, how old you are, what kind of financial situation, God has a blessing for you. Do you realize, We remember we talked about in John 1, we talked about John and he was going forth as a witness to talk about Jesus. And Jesus actually refers to John the Baptist as one of the greatest of all men. But do you know that he wore these wild camel robes? And ate wild honey and locusts. How many of you would love to be around somebody like that? Can you imagine getting invited to his house for dinner? I don't know about y'all. I went on a little trip one time in the Army, and we were doing some survival training. And they were teaching us how to eat crickets and, and worms and all these things that could get you by. And you know what? We had this thing called pogey bait. Anybody know what pogey bait is in the Army? Pogey bait is when we brought our own food supplies with us. We had a rucksack, we had backpacks, and we used to put Chef Boyardee ravioli. We used to put all this stuff in there. Why? Because we didn't like the MREs. And everywhere that the military camped, you could see empty cans everywhere. We tried to bring it out, but there'd be a point in time where your pogey bait would run out. There'd be a point in time where you needed something more. And then you got mad because you had to resort back to what you were supposed to be eating in the first place. Guys, there's been some times where back when our sinful life, we get out there and live up the life, and then all of a sudden things go wrong, and we get told we need to repent, we need to come back, and then we get mad because we're told we've got to repent and come back to the way we should be. Guys, I'm here to tell you that everything that we need from God is right what He's given you. He's given you a son. His name is Jesus Christ. He is your Savior if you'll receive Him. You see, don't get to this point where you get set up on money you don't get saved by money you don't get saved by material wealth but you get saved by being reconciled unto God I find that Jesus being the light he came so that we could have reconciliation if I were to cut off every light in this place right now where it was completely dark and you couldn't see anything you would probably struggle for your way out but the greatest place to find the light of Christ is simply on your knees how many of you know if you try to move in your own power in darkness, you're going to just mess yourself up? Amen. Find a place during this holiday season. Don't get caught up in the gifts and the finances. Some of you say, Pastor, I don't have money for gifts. I get it. I understand. But yet, make sure that Christmas is about Jesus. Amen. Make sure you sit down at the table with your children, with your grandchildren, and tell the Christmas story about Jesus being in the manger. And then go up there and wait and see if they ever put that baby in that manger up here in town. Because I'm telling you, the moment they put that 10-foot long baby up in that thing, I want to be there to see that thing. But you see, I want to see Jesus being taught in my household. 
I want to see Jesus being taught in your household. I want to see Jesus being worked on in your heart. You see, because when we start thinking about Jesus and we start thinking about who he is, then our lives change. Because then we open ourselves up to who we are. Guys, if you would, would you bow your heads and close your eyes for a second. Today I wanted to give you some extra time. And I wanted you to be able to understand that being a family means that you have somebody to turn to. I want you to be able to look around. I want you to see those people that are sitting beside you right now. And those people that are sitting beside you are probably somebody that's important to you. Somebody that you love. And maybe you may not have everything that you want or everything that you need to give to somebody. But let me tell you something. A hug and a pat on the back, a prayer means everything, especially during this season. So guys, I'm going to ask you that if all of a sudden you find that you're alone and you don't have somebody sitting beside you, or you don't have somebody waiting on you, I'm here to tell you that the light of the world came. His name was Jesus. He wants you to know him personally because I can already tell you he knows you. I don't have to introduce him to you, but I hope that you'll introduce yourself to him. And when you receive him, you find out he is our wonderful counselor. He is our friend. He is our prince of peace. And right now, I think we all need peace. We need some joy. We need some love. Is there anybody here today say, Pastor, I'm struggling? Man, this holiday season has got me messed up and I'm struggling. And I just need God's compassion, his grace. Because I don't want to receive this grace in vain. I don't want to take it for granted. I want to hold on to it for what it is. If that's you, would you please raise your hand right now? Because I want to make sure that you do not leave here without knowing Jesus is right there with you. Anybody at all? Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Father, I ask that, Father, that you would teach us what it's like to, Father, to walk in your grace, your peace, and your mercy, and not receive it in vain, and, Father, to change what it means. Lord, I ask that, Father, that you would teach us what it's like to be Christmas again. Lord, in that song, as we sang earlier, let it be Christmas everywhere. But, Lord, let it be for the right reason that Jesus Christ, our Savior, came unto this earth. Father, for those that would come seek him out would find him. That, Lord, we would be able to be reconciled unto a holy God that loves his children more than we could ever imagine. So, Lord, I ask that today you would touch, you would bless, that, Father, that you would restore, that, Father, that you would feel, that you would heal, that, Lord, that you would restore and give us so much more than we ever thought possible. Father, I ask that today as we release these people, Lord, today is just the beginning time of Christmas. And Lord, yes, there will be presents that will be swapped. And Lord, there will be dinners that will be eaten and parties that will be given. But Lord, I ask in Jesus' name that, Father, for each family that's represented here in this household today, that, Father, those parties, those dinners, Father, those things where gatherings, where people come together, that always be about you. I ask that the Holy Spirit fill that place. And Father, touch people's lives. Father, draw people nearer to them, closer to them. Father, bring and restore hope back unto man. Lord, we no longer want to live in the dark, but Father, we want to walk in the light. Lord, I ask that, Father, as your word says, that you are a light unto our feet. That, Father, that you would light our path as we go. And Lord, that you would show us every single place that we're supposed to go. That you would teach us in every lesson, in every place that we come across. Every problem and obstacle that we cross. That, Lord, we always cross it. We always deal with it with you. So, Lord, we love you. We praise you. We glorify you. And, Lord, I speak your blessings upon these people today. That, Lord, they are blessed. They are the head and not the tail. They are the top and not the bottom. They're blessed in their comings. They're blessed in their goings. Lord, they're blessed in their families their homes, their health, their finances, their businesses, their crops, their herds. That, Father, their fields are full. 
Lord, we thank you for their barns, that, Lord, they are filled as well. And, Lord, they don't need bigger barns. They just need more neighbors. Lord, I ask as we go into this time of economic hardships and tolls and tribulations that we're seeing not only in this country but throughout the world, that, Lord, that you would just provide supernaturally. That, Father, as uh, inflation is up and, Lord, our money is running shorter, but, Father, your grace is running so much more. Lord, we ask that, Father, that you'll give everything that needs to be given, that, Lord, we'll see you and we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, and give you the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, all God's people said, guys, y'all are released, and believe it or not, it's only 1136. Y'all be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.